Life Audio. On this episode of Encouragement for You, Missions Authority Steve Saint talks about shrewdness, and Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley discuss emotional intelligence. Welcome to the Encouragement for You podcast, brought to you by Encouragement Communications in association with the Salem Web Network and is part of the Life Audio Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. In just a moment, your host, Don Hawkins, will introduce today's episode. First, a word from our sponsors. Shrewdness, a topic you might not have given much thought to, but it plays a vital role in stewarding well the resources God has given. On this episode of Encouragement for You, Don Hawkins speaks with Steve Saint, author of The End of the Spear, on how shrewdness plays an important role in furthering the kingdom of heaven. I'm Don Hawkins. On today's program, Steve Saint, author of The End of the Spear, will be discussing a concept you may not have given much thought to, shrewdness. Let's listen in. You know, this is one of those unusual passages in the Bible where if you look at it, oh, once or twice, it, it kind of, it's kind of confusing because Jesus is talking to his uh, disciples, and as he, as he frequently did, he starts telling them a story. And he says, hey, once upon a time there was a, a rich man who had a business manager or steward, it calls it in here, and uh, this steward was reported to the master as, um, you know, kind of laying down on the job. And what he was doing is instead of taking care of his master's possessions, he was squandering them. And it says, so the master called him in to him and said, hey, what's going on here? I want you to tell me what you've been doing because I've been hearing some bad reports about your stewardship, or you haven't been managing my affairs very well. So the steward said to himself, you know, after the master told him, hey, I, I, want to, I want you to get your accounts in order, and I want you to come and show me how you've been doing. And the guy said to himself, oh, man, I am in big trouble now. Because Ma- he major, knew he yep. had just been slipshod. Major trouble. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he said... Um, boy, what am I going to do now? He's going to can me for sure. Now, a little bit of a paraphrase. But a good paraphrase. And uh, he said, you know, I really am in a fix because if this guy sacks me as as his business manager, who else is going to want to hire me? And then he said to himself, man, and I'm not strong enough to dig or to do hard work. And I'd be embarrassed to go out and beg. So he realized, man, I gotta, I gotta think up something because when I'm out of this job, I better, I better have a little cushion, financial cushion to fall back on. And then he came up with this idea. Now remember, this is, we're, we're reading the Bible here, and it says, he said to himself, "Oh, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do something so that when I'm kicked out as the steward." that there will be people who will want to invite me over to their homes and take me in. And so he started calling those people that owed his master money. And it says, um, he began by saying to the first debtor, he said, uh, hey, how much do you owe my master? And the the person who had borrowed the money said, "Uh, I owe him 100 measures of oil. And so the steward said to him, you know, I've been thinking, what do you say we take your bill and let's change it from a hundred measures of oil and I'm going to agree to change it to just 50 measures of oil. In verse 8 is the real surprise because the master finds out that his business manager has not only been squandering his goods but now he's been he's been cutting his accounts receivable way down mm-hmm. and it's obvious to the master that the reason he's doing it is exactly right. This guy has figured out, hey, I need people to owe me when I no longer have a job. So he's writing off the accounts receivable so that these people will feel indebted to him and will, you know, take care of him when he's out of a job. But 
this is the this is the thing that surprises me because we sort of think of the Bible as being a you know goody goody two shoes book and yeah. mm-hmm. everybody always does everything right. Well, here's a man who has just really been a um, I mean he's been a scoundrel here. But when the master finds out about it, I would expect that the master would not only fire him, but the master would tell everybody what he had done and would call the authorities and make him make restitution. But instead, here it says, and his master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly. Hmm. Now, I'm going to paraphrase again. It says, you know, Jesus is telling this story, and then and then he asked the question, he said, man, why is it? that worldly people, secular people, yeah. are more shrewd in doing what they do than the children of light or sons of light. Yeah. And if you look at John twelve thirty six, it says that Christ is light. So the sons of light are really, you know, we're family relationship, sure. the sons of Christ, the Son of God, yeah. that we are the sons of light. And it, And then he says, I say to you, you guys, you sons of light, you make friends for yourselves by means mm. of the mammon of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. And I, the only thing I can come up with here is it saying, hey, listen, people in the world, they act shrewdly, and they're appreciated mm. for their shrewdness. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus himself, I think here, is saying, now what about you guys? Why can't you guys be clever like this? I mean, I've asked you to go and share my my invitation for eternal life with people. Why are you sitting around? Why are you just having committee meetings? Why don't you guys really get shrewd like people in the world do when they want to carry out their ends? And uh, when Jesus saw people in need, he dealt with them in the area of their need. What I think one of our big needs for shrewdness is that in missions and in trying to carry out Christ's commission, especially in other places, we go to places where people are desperate for work, and then we go and do things for them instead Hmm. of hiring them to do them. Um, We go to places where people really need entries um, or what we call door openers into non or communities that are hostile to the Christian message they need to be able to go in there and do something for the people to build credibility and yet what we do is we go over there and uh, we offer services ourselves you know for a couple of weeks and leave and I don't mean to step on toes that's not the purpose here but if we're going to be shrewd it doesn't do a whole lot of good for North Americans to go to these places for a couple of weeks and, you know, do their thing, even if they work hard and then come home. If we're going to be shrewd, what we need to do is we need to put these door openers in the hands of these local people. And instead of going over and building more and more in Bible, in, Bible institutes and seminaries, there's a lot of places where there are more people already Bible trained to go out and share the message but they can't go out because they can't fix the outboard motor on the boat so Mm. they can get there. They don't have money to buy fuel for the canoe. And Mm. uh, so they're all sitting congregated in the area where the seminary or Bible Institute is located. And what national people keep asking me is, we want to know the Bible, but we already have people trained in the Bible. What we need is we need people to come and train us in communications and transportation and uh, and dental and medical services so that we can go and get the door open. And I say, hey, mm. it is not very shrewd if we go to places like that and just because it's acceptable to to people because it's what we've been doing and so it seems like what we ought to do, we go and just keep building more Bible institutes. Yeah. And, and we're not against Bible institutes. You no. know, I'm involved in a Bible college. But, you know, having said that, I, I think, Steve, what you're saying just resonates from the standpoint of 
you know, here are, and I heard this for years and years and years, you know, the only truly spiritual missions is to either preach the gospel or train the saints. And that means either planning a church, building a Bible college or Bible institute or building a seminary. And, uh, you know, those things tended to play well with the supporters back home. And uh, people could relate to that and say, boy, they are in the core of the really spiritual missions. Whereas people who are doing medical and dental work are maybe at a secondary level. And then people who are doing things like fixing outboard motors or providing fuel or providing uh, the means for people to earn the money to be able to go out and present the gospel, uh, there it's still a third level of missions. You, you ever get exposed to that kind of thinking? Well, I, you can't imagine how many times I've heard people say, you know, I really like what you guys are doing at iTech, training and equipping national believers so that they can go out and do this sort of work. But then they'll say frequently something like, but we have a policy that hmm. we only give to people that are involved in church planning. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying that's a little bit like somebody saying to a farmer, man, I really like the way you go out and spray pesticides on your your fields to keep the bugs from eating your plants. And and I'm really fascinated by how you go out with a cultivator and, um, you know, cultivate the the crops to keep the weeds from growing. But say, you know, we'd really like to help you in this, but we have decided that we're going to limit our activities to uh, to planting. I mean, hmm. that's that's yeah. what we do. Buy seed, put it in the ground, that's it. Yep. Nothing but else. But don't cultivate it so, right. so the weeds grow up. And, and certainly don't, don't use any chemicals on it. Yep, because then the, then the, then the bugs are all going to eat it. And, you know, the farmer might say, but you know what? The objective here is to get a harvest, and if we're hmm. going to get a harvest, we need to not only plant the seeds, but we got to cultivate them, we got to you know, spray pesticides. Let's just listen and obey. Let's keep listening to what God is saying, both through his word and what he tells us individually. And, and he can, he can, he can communicate that to us. And then let's do what he tells us to do. And let's not try to be super, super spiritual. Um, Let's just be obedient. And I think then finally, like my dad being a shrewd man who is even willing to give his life I think where that started was just being willing, little step by little step, you know, obeying what God wanted him to do. And that's what I'm trying to do, and I think that that's how we'll count. We'll be back with more after this brief word from our sponsors. Strong Emotional Intelligence an important factor in remaining encouraged through all life situations. Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley, authors and family authorities, help us understand how to manage our emotions well. Here's your host, Don Hawkins. And Aaron, I would suspect, uh, at least I would think, that there is a good chance that women have more emotional intelligence than men if we generalized. Would that be an accurate observation or am I way off base? No, I think that you're right on track, that typically women are better at managing and recognizing their own feelings and also those feelings in others. And really that's the bottom line of what emotional intelligence is. It's recognizing your own feelings and those of others and then managing and knowing what to do with these emotions. And typically women are better at that, but sometimes not. Do we is sometimes use the term intuitive in there? Is that part of what we're talking about? Yeah, I believe so. You know, because, Don, the reality is is that, you know, little girls are, are, are encouraged more and given more permission to really to, to, to think about their emotions and to talk about their emotions and to mm-hmm. have emotions than, unfortunately, than, than as young men and little boys. And I know that, that I was severely handicapped. Now, of course, Aaron might say I'm still really <laughs> handicapped in many ways, but we're not going down of, that road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> but really, girls have the the emotional vocabulary. We have so many more words per day anyway, and often we are just better equipped with those emotional words. Where often little boys have hmm. noises, and you know, I I loved Greg's word of explaining how he felt for the first eight years of our marriage, 
every day after he got home from work, how, how was your day? Fine. Mm, yeah. It was fine. One, one word, one four-letter word, and it, <laughs> after a while probably came off like a four-letter word. Exactly. That's you know, right. And you know what fine stands for? No. Feelings what? inside not expressed. Mm, boy, a lot of truth in that. And, and for a lot of us as men, that's sort of how we relate. Uh, it seems to me, Erin, that, that a woman can get in this situation, especially if she's been abused or has been through some kind of trauma, and uh, that that can be a reality for a female as well as a male. Yes, I think often when a woman has been through trauma, her heart closes down. And really, emotions in general are the voice of our heart. And what happens often is that then they retreat back to using just their mind and their brain for expressing um, their their ideas and feelings. But really, we need to do both, our heart and our brain combined in combination. That's how the Lord made us. How do, how do those two things, Greg, work together? How do we get our hearts and our minds in sync if this is a sort of a challenging or difficult thing for us? Well, I think especially for men that we often default to, to our brain and, and being more logical, analytical, kind of thinking our way through life. And, and as Aaron was saying, I mean, you know, the, 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 our emotions are so incredibly important. I mean, God created us as emotional beings. Christ demonstrated so many emotions. You know, I mean, take the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. I mean, there, there's so many examples of, of, why, of how God created our emotions. And, and really, God created our emotions to be a, a, a great source of information. Hmm. You know, emotions are neither right nor wrong. They're, they're, they're neither good nor bad. They're, you know, they're, they're illogical most of the time. I mean, the reality is we, 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 we need to see emotions as a source of information, something, something that we need, a desire that we have. Maybe it's reflecting a belief that we have. And if we use emotions... Um, then we can make the best possible decision when we use our brain and our emotions together. Don, literally, that's the best possible way to make a decision. That, that feels safe when we yeah. do that. And, you know, that fits, Greg, very much with the concept of the fruit of the Spirit, which begins with love in Galatians 5.22. So obviously uh, there's an emotion. Obviously it's tied to action. It's tied to choice, to decision. But clearly love is an emotion. And then you have joy, and, and that's an emotion. Uh, peace would certainly be equilibrium in emotions. And then you wind up with self-control, and where you have the mind and the emotions working together, uh, you certainly have that facet in place. And I go back, I think, Aaron, it was you who tied down the definition for us of emotional intelligence, the ability to handle emotions, understand emotions, and handle them in ourselves and in others. Um, do some people have more trouble handling emotions in relationship than handling their own emotions, or is it pretty much if you have trouble with handling your own emotions, you're going to have trouble with uh, relationship emotions? Well, you know, Don, obviously a relationship is going to be more intense, and so we're going to experience things at a, at a, at a greater degree. So if, if I'm not good at identifying, recognizing my emotions and knowing how to manage them, then that's only going to be exacerbated in, within my relationship. So that's just going to intensify that, that deficit. And, and, and the problem is is that, that, that people, and, and sadly a lot of Christians, um, really knock emotions and, and see them more is the problem. And, you know, we, 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 we need to think more. And, and they stuff their emotions. They judge their emotions. They ignore them. You know, or, or the other extreme is that they're led by their emotions and, and make decisions based simply on their emotions. In other words, emotions equal fact. I feel, therefore, it must be true. Therefore, mm. I then need to act. Yeah. And that's part of the problem in our relationships is we have never learned really how to manage them once we understand what they are. And we're talking about the subject of emotional intelligence. Let's take a phone call or two. Uh, I'm seeking godly advice to restore and reconcile my marriage that was almost three years, and somehow I, I, I dropped the ball. And, and, and it was not a moral issue. It was I wasn't emotionally intellectual. Uh, meaning that I, I used controlling, uh, not consciously. I just was not aware of it. I, I, I was military, and I was too militaristic, 
and uh, I, I, I burn her out. And I've had many counselors and stuff tell me, just trust God. And, of course, I trust God. But I really need all the resources mm-hmm. how to become emotionally intellectual yeah. in, in handling this for the future because I'm yeah. trusting God to restore yeah. it. You know, I, let me just, first of all, thank you and commend you for calling and, and for your honesty and acknowledging, you know, that the problem started with you and your background. You know, that's a great place to begin and, and just, you know, a huge step in dealing with uh, issues, whether it's marriage or emotions or whatever, is by saying, you know, I have a problem. The problem is with me. And uh, that kind of honest confession uh, is a huge step. And Greg, I know it does your heart as well as Aaron's good uh, to hear David share that. And I know you guys have some practical things to share with him. Absolutely. And again, I want to say, I can just hear the humility um, in your voice. And, and again, really appreciate that. And, and first of all, let me let me let me encourage you this way. If if I only had one hour with a couple, I would say always focus all your attention on how can you create a relationship with your spouse um, that feels safe. Hmm. And I'm talking more emotional safe. And and part of how you can become emotionally safe is is to really focus on being and using empathy. Empathy is the key in terms of emotional intelligence with other people. In other words, how, what has her experience been like? How have you made this relationship feel unsafe to her? What, have, what, what issues or problems or hurts have, have you created in her? And, and again, your ability to really allow her words to touch your heart and to really listen and, and, and empathize, that can be a big step, Don, in, in really yeah. opening up her, her heart. But I'm, I'm hoping that God will in time uh, through the Holy Spirit will woo her into understanding that I'm so sorry and, and, and he convicted me of my wrong. And so what other resources? Yeah, let's let's talk to Greg and Aaron and find out, you know, what would be the best step. Uh, in fact, a, a couple of questions here, I think, and, and maybe Aaron, you could deal with the first one. From a woman's perspective, uh, here's David and and uh, his wife right now has that emotional clenched fist of feeling, you know, uh, no desire to reconcile. Uh, what should be his approach, his uh, strategy uh, in, in the right sense to, to try to woo back his wife? Right. And, you know, I, go, I would go right along with what Greg was saying, is that you have to make the relationship feel safe. And it sounds like in the past it probably didn't feel real safe if there was emotions that escalated and, And, you know, it sounds like you're taking responsibility for that, which is great. However, it's now rebuilding trust and rebuilding safety into that relationship. And that's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And she is the one that controls her heart. She can open or close her heart. And so as as long as you are doing these things, not trying to manipulate her or attempting to control her Mm. back into the relationship, I think the best thing you can do is provide that safety and that assurance that you're you're there, that this is a change that you're committed to making regardless of what she does, yeah. that this is this is who you are now. And and just to, to validate to what Aaron and Greg have told you from Scripture, uh, Galatians six nine would be a great verse for you to latch on to, memorize, and apply in your situation. Uh, Let's not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Thank you for listening to this episode of Encouragement for You with Don Hawkins, host of Encouragement Live Radio and author of over 25 books, including Never Give Up and Master Discipleship Today. You can find more about Don and his books at encouragementlive.org. Encouragement for You is a production of Encouragement Communications with the Salem Web Network and LifeAudio.com. Editing by Phil Gebers. Production by Elizabeth Andrade. If you enjoyed what you heard today, we'd love for you to head over to your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. It really does help people find us. Let me take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on Encouragement for You. If you go to LifeAudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Stay encouraged and join us next time for Encouragement for You.